Welcome to Chapter 7 of Bio246, Anatomy and Physiology on the Skeletal System. Uh, first of all, with the first section for Chapter 7, we need to be able to list the structures of the skeletal system, compare and contrast the compact and spongy bone, and identify the types and locations of cartilage within the skeletal system. So starting with the components of the skeletal system, we have the bones of the skeleton, cartilage, ligaments and tendons, and other connective tissue. Uh, bones are referring to the primary organs of the skeletal system, and they are the rigid framework of the body. They provide stability and support, uh, but they have many other functions too. We'll, we'll get to those. Uh, types of bone within that skeleton, we have compact bone, which is also known as dense or cortical bone. That's 80% of the bone mass. And the spongy bone, which is also known as cancellous or trabecular bone. And it's located internal to the compact bone. Uh, it appears porous and it's 20% of the bone mass. Uh, cartilage is semi-rigid connective tissue. It's more flexible than bone. Uh, types are supporting uh, that are within the uh, skeletal system are the supporting connective tissue, uh, the hyaline cartilage, which provides support, uh, attaches the ribs to the sternum, covers ends of some of the bones within the growth plates. Uh, it's a model for bone formation. And also fibrocartilage, which is the weight-bearing cartilage that withstands or resists compression. And it's found in the invertible discs, the pubic symphysis, and the menisci of the knee. And also, we have dense regular connective tissue, the ligaments, which connect bone to bone, and the tendons, which connect muscle to bone. Then looking at our uh, skeleton here, in, a, in the adult and juvenile skeleton, we can see the articular cartilage, and then this long bone here, and the epiphysis here, and then you have the epiphyseal plate here, and the diaphysis, which we'll talk more about here, look at these bones a little bit more in a short bit here, and epiphyseal plate, again, at the other end, both at the uh, proximal and the distal ends of the long bones. But you also have a lot more, certainly more hyaline cartilage, the blue here, then we have fibrocartilage, the red here, uh, the fibrocartilage, basically the three primary places you typically see it, are invertible discs, uh, with pubic symphysis, and then down below here in the menisci of the knee. Then we have hyaline cartilage, uh, significant locations like uh, the mobile joints, like the shoulder and the hip in particular here, uh, where the femur meets the pelvis and where the humerus uh, meets the scapula, the glenoid fossa of the scapula. This picture is not exactly drawn to scale, I will say, too. The glenoid fossa is not nearly that large. Uh, the glenoid fossa is significantly smaller than the humeral head. Uh, but that said, you can see where there's a lot more hyaline cartilage prevalent throughout the body than there is the fibro cartilage. So with that basic section for first section here, you should be able to compare the appearance of compact bone and spongy bone, and in what three locations of the body do you find fibrocartilage? Uh, now with section 7.2, uh, we want to be able to then move on here to be able to describe the general functions of bone, describe the four major classes of bones as determined by shape, uh, describe the structural components of a long bone, and compare the gross anatomy of other bones to that of a long bone. Also explain the general function of blood vessels and nerves that serve a bone, uh, compare and contrast the structure and locations of the two major types of, or the two types of bone marrow, and name the four types of bone cells and their functions, and describe the composition of the bone's matrix. Uh, I'll also further be able to explain the bone matrix formation and resorption, uh, compare the structure of compact bone and spongy bone, and analyze the structure of hyaline cartilage and the cells in its matrix. Not only, of course, is this information, as always, these basic learning objectives that we note here, is it not noting important information you should be able to discern or know when you have a good grasp of the concepts, but obviously, if you know this information, you're probably in really good shape for your examinations going forward as well. Uh, for our general functions of the skeletal system uh, for bones, bones perform several basic functions, of course, support and protection. Uh, they're the levers for movement. Uh, basically, one bone is a, is a lever, a lever system. You have two bones, one moving against the other one, or, or both and possibly potentially moving at the same time. Uh, hemopoiesis, or aka hematopoiesis, uh, blood cell and platelet production. Uh, it occurs in the red bone marrow of the connective tissue. And the storage of mineral and energy reserves. Uh, calcium specifically for muscle contraction, blood clotting, and release of neurotransmitters in the nerve cells, and phosphate, uh, the structural components of AT uh, one of the structural components of ATP, uh, the inorganic phosphate you're always referring to whenever ATP is uh, split off in ADP and inorganic phosphate from ATP. Uh, the nucleotides and phospholipids, obviously a big part of a lot of our membranes, and uh, the component of plasma membrane as well. As far as classification of bones, are four classes. We have the long bones that are greater in length than they are in width. The most common ones refer to like the femur and the humerus. Uh, the short bones 
uh, where their length is nearly equal to their width, uh, like the carpals and the tarsals in particular. And of course, we also have sesamoid bones, which are uh, technically short bones as well. And the one that's most prominent that we are most aware of is our uh, largest one, which is our patella, our kneecap. Uh, flat bones, flat, thin surfaces, they may be slightly curved. Uh, we typically have a lot of connection, contact points uh, on these flat bones for uh, tendons and connective and other connective tissue with muscle attachments to these bones. Uh, cranial bones are an example, among others, as well as the scapulae. Uh, the regular bones, they're elaborate, sometimes complex shape, like the vertebrae. Then we have just a little picture here. So you can see a flat bone referring to very smooth bone here, like the frontal bone of the skull here, the regular bones like the vertebrae or a vertebra for a single one, long bone like a femur, uh, short bones referring to like the tarsals in the uh, feet. So the regions of a long bone, and going back to our long bones, as a diaphysis, which is a, technically the, it's really the long shaft, the elongated, usually cylindrical type shaft, provides leverage and weight support. It's compact bone with thin spicules of a spongy bone extending inward. Uh, then it has a medullary, medulla, medullary cavity, uh, hollow cylindrical space within the diaphysis. It contains more red bone marrow uh, in children. Uh, that red bone marrow, again, is hemopoietic, uh, blood cell forming. Uh, whereas the axial, axial skeleton of adults and the proximal epiphyses of each femur and humerus is more common, commonly found for adults, less so in the uh, periphery for uh, adults. Oops, go back here for a second. Uh, whereas there's more yellow bone marrow in adults after about age 40, it gets around 50, 50, somewhere in there in the late 30s, around 40, uh, typically speaking. And then typically you see more and more or less and less of the red bone marrow, which you really say, uh, as time goes on, especially past the 40s, uh, where it becomes much more prominently yellow bone marrow, less of the red. And the yellow bone marrow is more mesenchymal stem cells producing fat, cartilage, and bone. Uh, the other regions of the long bone, the epiphysis, is a knobby region at each end of the long bone, by the proximal and distal ends. Uh, the proximal epiphysis is the end of the bone closest to the body trunk, uh, and the distal epiphysis, of course, is the end farthest from the trunk. And they're composed of outer thin layer of compact bone and the inner region of spongy bone. And then we also have the articular cartilage that covers the joint surface at the end of the epiphysis. Uh, the thin layer of the hyaline cartilage it reduces friction and absorbs shock in movable joints. And as the metaphysis, metaphysis or metaphysis uh, is the region of the mature bone between the diaphysis and the epiphysis, epiphysis, excuse me. The epiphyseal plate, also known as a growth plate, is in the metaphysis, and it's a thin layer of hyaline cartilage, provides for long or lengthwise bone growth. In adults, the epiphyseal line is the remnant of the epiphyseal plate. There comes a point around maturity, around sexual maturity, where uh, the epiphyseal plate fuses with the, with the bone, and it becomes Part of the, the natural bone is no longer a, a plate for growth because the bone long bones aren't going to grow anymore at that point. So here we have a closer look at our long bones. So we have our articular cartilage, cartilage at the end of that epiphysis here. That's the proximal epiphysis in this case, one closest to our uh, body or axial skeleton. And the spongy bone here, the epiphyseal line that epiphyseal in an adult, or it'd be epiphyseal plate in a, in a someone who hasn't reached sexual maturity yet. And the compact bone here, compact bone layer along the outside there, that bone there, spongy bone deeper. You see the little matrix uh, as we're see, looking at this here as well. The medullary cavity, that big opening space there uh, inside the bone, deeper part of the long bone. The endosteum is basically here between that medullary cavity and the uh, compact bone here. Uh, I should say between the spongy bone and the uh, medullary cavity. And of course, the outer layer there of that uh, bone, the compact bone, the periosteum and the perforating fibers. Of course, the diaphysis is that long shaft there of that bone here. And typically speaking, a uh, long bone will have one nutrient artery through the nutrient foramen kind of coming into for blood supply. And of course, now we have the metaphysis down here and the, now the distal end and the distal epiphysis as well with articular cartilage once again uh, now here at the end of this bone here. As far as the coverings and linings of the bone, then, like we just showed a moment ago, there's a tough sheath uh, covering the outer surface of bone, the periosteum. It's the outer fibrous layer of dense, irregular connective tissue. It protects the bone from surrounding structures and anchors blood vessels and nerves to the bone surface since the attachment site for the ligaments and the tendons. Uh, there's an intercellular layer that includes the osteoprogenitor cells, the osteoblasts, and the osteoclasts, which we'll talk about shortly. And it's attached to the bone by numerous collagen fibers uh, and perforating fibers. 
So we have the periosteum here uh, with the compact bone, the osteocytes here, our fibrous layer, outer layer here, cellular layer here between, uh, and then we have the perforating fibers as well of that periosteum. Uh, the coverings and linings of bone, the endosteum is the covering of all the internal surfaces of the bone within that medullary cavity, and it's an incomplete layer of cells. It contains the osteoprogenitor cells, the osteoblasts, and the osteoclasts. And then the endosteum, uh, we can see here again, there's osteocyte once again here in the spongy bone, osteoclasts here, a smaller guy there, and the nuclei, a little more prominent, uh, with osteoblasts here, okay, see these osteoblasts, and the osteoprogenitor cells here. All within that endosteum here. So the gross anatomy of the other bone classes, we have the short, flat, and irregular bones. They differ from long bones, of course. Uh, the external surface is composed of compact, compact bone. The interior is composed of spongy bone or diplo or diploi. Uh, there's spongy bone in the flat bone of the skull, and there's no medullary cavity. So flat bones in the skull, in this case, look in the flat bones of the skull. We have the periosteum once again here. Uh, we have compact bone lying underneath there uh, with the spongy bone then below that of that periosteum. And the blood supply and the innervation of the bone, the blood supply is uh, where a bone is obviously living a living organ, and so that bone is highly vascularized in a region of spongy bone in particular, and vessels enter from the periosteum and the nutrient foramen, which we showed one with that long one as well. Uh, there's a small opening or a hole in the bone, and the artery entrance and the vein exit here, and nerves that supply the bone accompany the blood vessels through that foramen. And they innervate the bone, they per the periosteum, the endosteum, and the marrow cavity, and they're mainly sensory nerves. And bone marrow is a soft connective tissue of the bone. Uh, we have red bone and yellow bone marrow once again. The red bone marrow is a myeloid tissue, hemopoietic, it's blood cell forming. It's particular connective tissue, uh, immature blood cells and fat. Uh, in children, again, it's located in the spongy bone and the medullary cavity of the long bones. In adults, it's only located in the selected areas of the axial skeleton, really. Uh, the skull, the vertebrae, ribs, sternum, ossa, coxae, and the proximal epiphyses, the humerus, and the femur. So the yellow bone marrow is a product of red bone marrow degeneration as children mature, whereas adults, as they mature into adults. It's a fatty substance. It can convert back to red bone marrow during severe anemia or conditions with reduced erythrocytes, red blood cells. It facilitates production of additional erythrocytes. And then we see the red bone marrow here. An adult here uh, with a skull and the rib cage, the vertebrae, the pelvis, uh, basically in the shoulder here as well for the adult, whereas the child you tend to see uh, throughout the body, all throughout the body. So more towards maturity, you'll see it less prevalently. Uh, clinical view with a red bone marrow transplant. A red bone marrow transplant, when the bone marrow is destroyed by radiation or chemo, it's one of the many, many uh, devastating results, unfortunately, with radiation or chemo in an attempt to kill off cancer. It kills a lot of living things in the body as well, or with abnormally functioning marrow uh, as well, where a transplant may be needed. Harvested cells are injected to the bloodstream of the recipient. And they migrate to normal locations for red bone marrow, but there must be a match between the donor and recipient so the immune system does not attack it, which is always the, the uh, potential risk for anything that's put into the body, right? The immune system is going to attack it, it recognizes it as a foreign object and wants to kill it. Uh, so that's a big problem for uh, one many reasons why it's very difficult to find a match for any kind of transplant, let alone bone marrow, which is obviously very crucial and a very difficult and painful process as well. So what did you learn? Uh, what two minerals are stored in the bone and what are their functions in the body? Uh, what are several examples of flat bones in the body? And how do the diaphysis and the epiphysis of a bone differ in structure? Uh, what's the function of a nutrient foramen in bone? Where is red bone marrow found in the adult skeleton? We'll come back to uh, microscopic anatomy and the bone connective tissue here shortly.